Well, welcome, Marco. Thanks for doing this. All right. <laughs> so you've had a long, illustrious career, and you obviously love music. I can see all the guitars in the background. Um, so when did that love first begin? Uh, when I was... I, I can sort of trace everything back. Hmm. And it, it, it's been a sense of embarrassment. I'm not embarrassed about it. And it's my formative year is 1972, when I was 13. I was 13 in April 1972. So all my favourite albums come from 1972, which is For Your Pleasure and Transformer. And that's really, I mean, I, I, I liked music before that, but it, 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 mm. wasn't, it wasn't the passion. Um, so from 1972 onwards, then I became, um, I started to play properly. Well, I mean, a lot of people say I can't play now, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I got a guitar in 1972, started getting, you know, had no, obviously at 13, you have no, I mean, some people do, some some people are very ambitious, and they've got, at 13, they've got all these plans, and, you know, and things they're going to do, and they've written all these journals and timelines of things, like Hitler, he did that, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've, I've never been as, as ambitious uh, my ambitions have always been quite moderate, not like Hitler's. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just that, 1972. That's where I really got kind of really sort of bitten by bitten by music, and uh, I don't know if I decided that I want to be a musician at, at, at 13. You think that's sort of impossible? Mm. You don't really know. You don't think about what every other person, every other musician, was start exactly like you. Yeah. At home with your mum's with some shit guitar. I mean, that's how everybody starts. Maybe they start a bit younger. Maybe some of them start a bit younger. Maybe they start when they're 10 or something. But apart from that, it's, it's just you, you become a teenager, you get a guitar from somewhere, and then that's that's when it all starts. Hmm. When did you start playing in bands and so on? Sorry? When did you start playing in bands? Oh, um, uh, I didn't start playing in bands. I couldn't play in bands. I, I, I couldn't play with bands, and I didn't know any musicians. So mm. I was sixteen, so I went to art school. I met a, and I met a couple of guys at art school, and then punk happened, and then suddenly, uh, yeah, I mean, I saw the Sex Pistols, and like a lot of people. A lot of people saw the Sex Pistols. Like I always like that story of Peter Hook, where you went to see um, Sex Pistols at Manchester Free Trade Hall. Yeah. No, 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 no ambitions to be a musician. Had never wanted to be a musician. Never wanted to play anything. And then uh, he saw the Pistols next morning. He went out and bought a bass. He, he, he doesn't know why. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it was a bit like that. I mean, I saw the I saw the Pistols very early on. I saw them at the old Paradiso. And you, you're struck by two, you were struck by two things, which is one, fucking hell, this is fucking brilliant. But also the thing that never happened before when you think things are brilliant, you could, this is fucking brilliant. But I could do this. I mean, you never got that sense. You, know, you never saw David Bowie on TV it's going, fucking hell, that's amazing. But yeah, but anybody could do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, that was just everything was just out of reach. But suddenly things were maybe in reach. Hmm. Maybe I thought maybe this is easier than I thought it was. Yeah. And um, the great thing about punk is it lowered the bar. You know, hmm. you didn't really yeah. have to be out of play. It was always, it, it's always, and it happened with our band as well, our, our first band. And so three blokes get together and then they haven't got a bass player. But they do. They do have another friend. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, right. You're the bass player, and you're on stage next Tuesday. Because everybody, everybody thinks that you know, just he's only got four strings. It's much easier to, yeah. to play bass than guitar. It isn't. <laughs> it is. <laughs> That's what you think. It's in fact much harder. But you know, you can just go boom, 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 boom. Yeah. You go, oh, look, Mick, how hard can it be? So they've got four strings. Come on, you know. <laughs> so, 
What, what was your first ever gig? Um, Hundred Club Festival. Right. With, with Susan the Banshees. All oh, right. Yeah. Band that had been formed twenty four hours before. Right. It actually been had been formed. The idea had been formed for a couple of weeks. Unfortunately, it wasn't their idea. Mm. Uh, it was. It wasn't. Uh, Malcolm just said to Susan and Steve, "Right, we need." What it What it was is that Malcolm wanted to put on this um, punk festival, except he didn't have enough bands because there weren't enough bands. There's only three, okay. <laughs> so he needed mm -hmm. another one. So he, he just concocted one by basically just. Say to Susan and Steve, yeah, oh, yeah, you, know, you look good. You, you know, like, you should be in a band. I'll put you on the poster. Think of a name. And they thought of a name, and Susie thought of a name, which was actually, uh, uh, it was really um, fortuitous. It was a really good name, like Susie and the Banshees, because she saw Cry of the Banshee with, with Vincent Price on telly and thought, oh, that's a good name. Um, right. Also, I don't know if she she I don't know if she knew this, but Brian Ferry, his first band was called The Banshees. But I don't that's not the reason why I don't think she knew that. Right. I didn't know that at the time. So yes. anyway, that, that was that was um that was my first gig. And I'm sort of proud that, you know. So supporting the pistol, I mean it, it, you know, it, it, it sort of nowadays, you know been through what I've been through. It's like, so what? You're supporting some band I was aware of in, in a, at the 100 Club, which is like 200 people. It's like, you know, so no one cares. Mm. But then it was a huge deal to to, to us because while we were supporting the Pistols, our favourite band, mm. none of us had ever been on stage before. And, it, you know, and it was going to be packed. It wasn't, it was going to be, it wasn't going to be like most people's first gig, which is sort of like a couple of their friends and a dog and a drunk who's wandered off the street. It was actually <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's not a very big place, but, you know. Uh, so, um, so in terms of our lives, it was an important gig. So yeah. it's a really important gig coming up, and the only band in history has got an important, really important, high-profile first gig and they don't bother to that write any songs or rehearse. <laughs> but I mean, that just sounds mad. But I mean, before before punk, that would just sound insane. Like no one would do that. You can't yeah. play. You rehearsed anyway. Uh, you don't know what you're going to do. You haven't got any songs. Are you just going to go up there and do what? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but why this didn't occur to us? I don't know. It just didn't. It didn't work all right. And um, it was. And we did try to have a rehearsal. The Clash used to have this this rehearsal space in Camden Town before Camden Town was the place to be. It was just an awful. But I mean, I I live quite near there, so um, so I just walked up there with my guitar case. Um, uh, we and. Sid was there. I didn't really know. I didn't really. I didn't. I, I used to a bit. I didn't know Susie. I didn't know any of them. So I'm, I'm forming this man. These people. I don't really know. I don't know what we're going to do or what. I don't even know why we're doing it. Um. So we had a sort of rehearsal, and I could play. But none of them. I mean, Sid could play. Mm. He really wasn't a great drummer, but you know, but he could play drums. He could. He could keep a beat. And. Um, we just tried a few things and we just thought, this is useless. And Sid said, said well, fuck it, let's just make a noise. I thought, okay. <laughs> Start to make a noise. And actually, it seemed like a really good idea at the time. Actually, it was, in hindsight, a good idea. I was, I was we'd never done the gig. Yeah. So, see, Billy Idol was supposed to be playing guitar, but he dropped out. Right. Because Billy was one of these people like Hitler, <laughs> who was sort of like, <laughs> had, had his eye on the prize, he'd written all these songs and, you know, he was mm. actually going to go off and be a really proper musician with a proper band and a proper record deal and all that. Yeah. And, uh, which he did. And um, mm. we didn't know, we had no idea what we were doing or why we were doing it or why we were there or 
We just had nothing good to do. So we did it. We did it. And unfortunately, we, we you know, it being punk, it was accepted. Yeah. Also, also, I think in the back of our, although we never voiced it, I don't think I, we ever said, I ever said to any of them, it, it's like, let's just do Sister Ray. Let's just do, let's just do the Burger Underground. Yeah. Obviously, we're all big Burger Underground. But we all had the same, you know, Bowie, Roxy, Burger Underground. You know, it was all. I didn't even have to ask these questions like, oh, what do you listen to? I knew. Yeah. By just by listening, looking at my book. Um, so, you know, in the back of my mind was Sister Ray. Yeah. What I didn't know was that the, the, um, the Velvet Underground was speeding out of their nuts on methamphetamine. Oh, right. The reason, the reason is so long, well, those tracks are so long as they couldn't stop. <laughs> You, you played on the same bill as a, a very early um, version of Adam and the Ants as well, didn't you? When? Where? Um, well, the Banshees. No, um, it was one of your other bands, I think. Was it? Was it the oh. uh, Beast of Bands? No, uh, there was a band in the uh, a band called the Models. I think we supported them. No, they no, they supported us. Oh That's right, okay. Brayford Town Hall. Hmm. That, or Richmond Town or some some town hall in, in the suburbs and they supported us. But I mean I'd seen them, I knew them. I mean Jordan was managing them, so mm. I'd seen them before. I mean I went down to Jordan said, Oh look, the ants are playing this way, you've got to come come down to the shop at six o'clock, then we'll go and see the ants. Mm. And uh, they were playing at the man in the moon, which is literally I mean, I, do you know the King's Road? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know where the sex shop is. Yeah, yeah. Where the man in the moon is. That's still there. It's the, oh, pub, okay. it's the pub on the corner. Yeah. It's 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 a two minute walk. It's, like, <laughs> it's probably like a hundred feet away. Um. So me and Vivian and, and me and Jordan and Vivian went went to see Adam and the Ants. Um. And they were awful. And I just thought. And, and Adam was just, he had this leather rapist mask on him, just throwing himself around. It's like, I said, oh, this bloke's going mad. What's he doing? He's only, in a, he's only got six people here. But that's very much Adam. It's like, kind of like, it doesn't matter if there's one person or 10,000 people, he will put everything into it. Mm. It's, quite, it's not always appropriate, but that's just his way. <laughs> Well, the story goes that um, they came. He, he wanted you in his new version of the band, and um, he just put a note through your door to give him a call. Um, so, what, what went through your head when you saw the note? I had, strange enough, I had been out all night um, mm. the night before. And I came home, and there was a note from the door saying, "Call me Adam." I thought, I, I don't know how he got my address. Um, because it, it was, I was in another band. Okay, I was in another band called Green Marine at the time. Mm. And he knew them, but he didn't want, that's the first thing he said, so I don't, are you in Green Marine? And I said, no, I just left. So, because I don't want to start poaching people out of other bands because they're friends of mine and, you know. Mm. Yeah. So he didn't ask them for my, to, to this day, I must ask him actually if we are speaking again, how did you get my address? Um, my mum's address. So he didn't have my phone number. He couldn't ask for my phone number. So he just mm. come all the way up in the train up to we living in Harrow at the time. Um, all the way up in the train to Harrow on the Hill. And he found it. He found it. There's no, there's, there's no, you know, sat nav at the time. He must have had an A to Z. He just found it and came round. So he must have been keen. Um, mm. So I called him up and I, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, nothing. I'm not in Ring Marine. No, I'm not doing anything. And he said, good, because I, I, I want to work with you on a, on, a, on a new version of Adam and the Ants. Hmm. Oh, he didn't say that. He said, I want to I wanna work on a new, a new band. He wasn't at the time, he didn't know if it was going to be called Adam and the Ants. Right. But I, he was not... <clears throat> 
we didn't really want to call it adamant cancer at the time. We weren't sure. Mm. And uh, I said, well, what's happened to the other version of adamant cancer? I said, well, they threw me out. I said, how can <laughs> it's Adam and the Ants and you are Adam Ant? How can you be thrown out of your own band? I don't even have a name anymore. It's like, it's, well, you know, I'll meet up with you and Terry. We met up uh, in Covent Garden and, um, he, yeah, and he sort of said, yeah, like I said, I said, I, I, don't, I don't know if you should be the Ants or it should be something else. I don't, I don't know what to do, really. Mm. And I said, no, I it's your name, and you've been working for three years to establish that name. I think it was sort of, you sort of disappointed in that because it, it, it was always like, I can start afresh. Yeah. I can start afresh with a new name called, with a new band called the, I don't, I, I don't know what, and I, I, can do, and I can draw a line after that and do something completely new. Yeah. But then I said, yeah, but you, you, all that time would have been wasted. It's not, you haven't, you haven't spent three weeks on it, you spent three years on it. And you yeah. built it up and you've got a following. And he said, Yeah, I sort of I see the logic of that, yeah. So it was going to be Adam and the Answer Two. Hmm. So we should have called it Adam and the Answer Two, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um where did the idea for having two drummers come from? The glitter band. Oh, the glitter. Great. Wizard and uh, Shawadi Wadi, they all had two drummers. But it's really a pain in the ass because you never hear the other drummer over the other side of the stage. Now you could because you, you got in here monitoring, but then mm. such technology did not exist. So you can have so you had to choose your drummer, which the one I'm going to stand next to, which is Chris. Well, mm. Chris is like more usually more in time than Terry. Although Terry's my school <laughs> Although I went to school with Terry, he's one of my best friends, but I have to say that Chris is in time. So if I'm in time with Chris, then hopefully everybody else will be in time with us. Yeah. We, we can be in time. I mean, we had to worry about shit like that. It's like in, in those days, like, because we were so, so, you know, it was so early, you know, I mean, I mm. was 20. You were still going out of time. You were still trying hard to tune up. You know, I couldn't. Ch I I couldn't turn up to a studio now, and you know, and, 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 and I can't tune up. But I just, it's just <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know. So the the idea for the uh, Burundi style drumming. Um, so obviously that would uh, that was introduced to Adam, wasn't it, by uh, Malcolm McLaren earlier? Um, yeah. What did you think about all that? I thought it was a brilliant idea. Yeah. Because that, it was Malcolm had this record Burundi Black. To this day, I still don't know who made Burundi Black, <laughs> um, but it, it wasn't. I don't think it, it was ever in the charts or anything. But it, you heard it everywhere. It was, it was popular with skinheads. I mean, all the, all the skinheads at my school all liked Burundi Black, and I thought it was brilliant. I didn't know how it was done, and and, and what it was, it was an album, I think, called, I can't remember, you'd have to research this. I think it's called Warriors of the Drum or Warrior Drums of Burundi or something like that. And it was yeah. this album. And there was one track on it called Warrior of the Drum, I think. And they had just taken this track, put it onto tape and just played over it. And it worked, pulled that funky clavinet stuff. So right. it, it wasn't, so, you know, now you'd sample it. And, but... And that's what they did. So Adam had the album, Warriors of the Drum, the, um, or music, a music from the a land of Burundi. I don't know, I have to research this. I've got mm. it downstairs. I've still got that album. Um, yeah. I'll never look at it or play it, but I've got it. Uh, so, yeah, what was the question? Yeah, I mean, that was kind of an figure, and Mal uh, Adam was a bit like, kind of, yeah, but these are kind of like Malcolm's ideas. I said, but you played him a grand. So in my mind, I mean, that was a lot of money in 1979,000 pounds. Yeah. Uh, like 10,000 pounds now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you know, Adam spent his entire savings on, on this, on working with this boat for a couple of weeks. Um, so what I went mean, to my mind, I mean, I legally I'm actually right. But I didn't have a clue that I was actually legally right at that time. 
So when yeah. you pay, you paid in for his services, and, and those services include ideas. So you that you now bought those, you now bought those ideas of him, and they're yours. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. How, how did songwriting work between you? Uh, how did it work? Um, like it works between anybody. We just sit down with guitars and come up with a riff. And what mm. about this? What about that? Do you like this? Do you like that? But we had no way of recording anything of us except on a you know cassette player. Um, so we would have to actually play the song into a cassette player, and you know that would be the song. If we lost a cassette, that be that be it. You know, um, yeah, that's the end of that song because you couldn't remember it. Um, so that's how it works. I mean, uh, I mean, before even before cassette players, which was like pre nineteen sixty six, I wouldn't know how people from the early sixties or the late fifties wrote songs. Mm. We just have to, unless they could write things down, which they probably couldn't. You know, we just have to write the lyrics down. We sort of C G D, you know. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean you can remember the tune. Ah. Uh, well, I mean, we, it, it's like you just get, you got, you just got this song, this sort of outline of a song, yeah, and then you you just tell the drummer or drummers that you want this beat, steal this beat from this record, do that yeah. beat, and we'll try to play along to it. Fortunately, Burundi is in, is in a sort of four four, so yeah. we could play along to it. It wasn't, it, it's not a strange timing. It's not yeah. strange six eight jazz timing, which we could never play. I can't play it now. Um, yeah. So you just put it together as a band. You know, it was the interaction between the, the four or sometimes five people in the room. Yeah. Which is what a band does, really. They just sit there and sort of try and play together, and it all kind of fits. Yeah, I see. I mean, I can't. I mean, when when you're playing with someone, when you're playing with a drummer in the room, you you can't ignore it. You can't go off into your own time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what was the first song you wrote with Adam? I came to our frontier.
And how much would it change, um, you know, when you're playing it live? How, how much would it change over time before the recorded version would come about? I don't think we ever played it live before before we recorded it. Right. Bizarrely, you can play it live. After we, yeah. we, record, we recorded it, and but then when we came to play it live, apart from a few guitar overtops, I couldn't do. But I, you know, I fudged it um, by playing very loud and trying to sound like two guitars at the same time. Um, <laughs> it, it kind of worked. We made it. We made it work really well. Yeah. It, I mean, it basically like the record. It sounded like the records were the same people playing on it. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you, you took about um, 18 months in the band, didn't it, before you signed with uh, CBS? Well, I don't know if it was that long. Yeah. Was it? Okay. It was about that, yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, but um, I know there was other people interested in signing, it wasn't there. So, uh, why? Vegas Banquet. Vegas Banquet. Yeah. Um, they were very interested in signing us, except and at the time they were really big with Gary Newman. I don't know, it all fell apart. It all fell apart because, you know, we, we, the, the lure of like fame and fortune from Sony, which is a great big. <sighs> We'd long abandoned all punk credit, you know, notions of punk credibility and all that kind of like go with the indies and like, oh, fuck it, go with the majors because they can actually press more records. Yeah. Also offering more money. Yeah. Mm. So all, all that stuff, all that kind of like, in, you know, I've been through punk and indie and post-punk, and I just thought, this is all bullshit, really. <laughs> and we're just <laughs> going nowhere. It's really going nowhere. And it looks like they've all got these kind of like adolescent dreams of that. Adolescent socialist dreams of changing the music business. Well, you fuck up and change it. We'll do it. We'll do it the T Rex way. <laughs> the tried and tested. <laughs> so, um, so um, Adam was quite driven, wasn't he? Um, yeah, was yeah, it? It's very driven. It's very yeah. driven. I mean, he's a very driven person, but also at that time, obviously, he's been thrown out of his of his own band. You know. Mm. Uh, um, it'd been betrayed by his three best friends, or two best mm. friends. Um, it's been betrayed by his long serving band. Uh, yeah, he was terribly hurt. It was terribly, it was, it's like being, being dumped by three girlfriends all at the same time. Yeah. And obviously, anyone who's been dumped, unless they're a complete fucking wanker, I mean, their first, their first thought is remain. <laughs> obviously, you go through a period of, of, uh, terrible heartache, but then you want revenge. Mm. Uh, and, and and that added to the drawing, that added to it. It was funny about what when, once we'd had King's Royal Frontier out and it was number one everywhere and everything. He came in one day with cassette pet by Bow Wow Wow. He said, oh, you've got to listen to this. It's like Andy and Andy and Dave have made this, you know, they're in this, they're doing Bow Wow Wow and it's, it's and he put it on, he says, brilliant, it's brilliant, I love it, I love it. I said, it, it's, it's Andy and Dave, I thought, it's, uh, it's Lee, and, Lee and Matthew. And I thought, you hated them. I said, oh, I hate them. He said, you spent the last two years <laughs> going on about that. <laughs> I said, no, I, I don't care about that anymore. So oh, at last, it's, <laughs> at last is a, a rational response for you or something. Yeah. No, you're right, <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. No. But I mean, but I also, but I did feel that kind of like, oh, you know, Bow Wow Wow are the rivals. I did feel that. Mm. Well, they had a bit of success, didn't they? But obviously, the ants um, way overtook because you know you guys were like, you, you know, global superstars, weren't you? Really, uh, Bow Wow Wow never really sort of took off in the same way. Yeah. So you can you can afford to be magnanimous and go, really, this is really good. Mm. <laughs> they are really good. We say well. Oh, well, Adam um, famously never did took alcohol, never took drugs and that sort of thing. Um, did yeah. he try to enforce that on the rest of the band as well? No. 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 I think he might have done, I think he might have done had it been, um, had we had those sort of problems, but no one in the band except Kevin towards the end had those sort of problems. None of, I didn't drink 
I didn't, I didn't smoke then. Um, yeah. I didn't, nobody drank very much. I didn't drink at all. Hmm. So it, it wasn't an issue. So he had no need to impose anything on, onto us, you know. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue and it wasn't a problem. I mean, thank God, you know, because it's... Yeah. But we didn't think about it. I mean, it's not, you know, the, the amount of people will go off the rails and, yeah. and die. And this business is, well, uh, you know, it's untold, isn't it, as you well know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, we were lucky and we didn't have those problems. With loads of others, but not those. Yeah. The music press seemed to have it in for you, didn't they? Um, especially Enemy. Me. Uh, they were really vicious. Um, I think they were just... It, really does, it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It really matter. I mean, that, that was a very kind of... Yeah, but the Enemy was like a kind of middle-class socialist, you know, university students. Hmm. It's like adhering, still adhering to punk, which they had nothing to do with. And yeah. it's got these punk ideas secondhand. And it, but it didn't really know. We didn't really read it. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not. I mean, had we been in the early days, it does matter. I mean, reviews from the enemies. Although, King's Wife Frontier got glowing reviews everywhere and everything. Yeah. Judy Burchill called me a genius. Hmm. That's not, that's not isn't really saying much, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it does. It does. What was it like going on top of the pops? What surprised you about it the most? I was that it was like all those sorts of things, uh, a bit of an anticlimax. Hmm. A bit of an anticlimax. It was sort of um, just standing about in this. Everyone says, isn't the studio small? It's not, it's, it's not as big as you thought it was, but it's not small. Um, hmm. It's not just a room, it's quite a large room. It's a very large room. Um, uh, I don't know. I think the thing that struck me is like, you know, I've been waiting for this day for, God knows, you know, since, since 1972. So it's what, you know, kind of eight years. Eight years I've been waiting to go on top of the pots. Yeah. And, and then you realise that that's not the end of it. That's only the beginning. And then you've got to keep going to the top of the pots. And you think, oh, when I go on top of I will have made it. Well, you haven't. <laughs> yeah. You haven't. You've got your foot in the door. And, and most people don't get through the door. I mean, we did. 90% mm -hmm. people don't get through the door. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing that struck me. I, I just thought. But it's only just beginning. It isn't even beginning. It's just the beginning. Of, it's the pre-beginning. We haven't even started. Yeah. How much did it change your life being suddenly very, very famous? Um, well, completely. Yeah. Didn't live at home anymore. Um, I lived in central London. Uh, but it's like being in the eye of the storm. I think it'd be very different now with, with social media, but there was no social media, obviously. And mm. so you lived kind of... And, I mean, I partly decided I wanted to live like that, you know, kind of surround it. You, you're, you, you're actually only surrounded by your bandmates, and then by that time you're surrounded by security. <laughs> and you, know, you live your life in cars... In cars, in recording studios, in airport lounges, and you don't really interact with kind of the rest of the world. You don't ever yeah. get a chance. So that's that's your life. Then that's like that becomes your life. The rest, the rest of the, you know, all that's gone. But it was, that's fine. But that wasn't. I didn't want any part of it anyway. Which is why I was doing what I was doing. Yeah. You said in the past that you prefer to work on your own in the studio as well. Is that right? No, I don't. I know, not on my own. I don't like working on my own. Um, um, I prefer to work in the studio, but not on my own. In fact, one of the things about technology, in fact, this this system that I'm just completely complicated system that you can't see that I'm looking mm -hmm. at now. It's it's like 
it's it's like now people work remotely and, and that's that, that's okay for the beginning of ideas you know if someone said mm. it's, it's really useful because if we if we'd been able to do this in, in those days you know adam could have emailed me an idea so look, i've just had this idea and i just recorded it i just sent it to you so what you think <clears throat> but then to take that on it, it's like i think you have to be in the room with the people like i've been, I've just been just doing some guitar for some band and it, it's like it just goes on and on and on it's like they send me a track they don't know what they want and i just think of something and put it on and i send it back and they go yeah it's really really good it's brilliant but okay <laughs> could you change it <laughs> okay yeah, yeah all right and you change that bit and you send it back and then they go no, it's really 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 good but and <laughs> And it goes on for days, where, whereas if you're in the room, they would just go, you would just play it, and they'd go, yeah, I really like that, but the second part, could you do this? And it's instant. Mm. And it's yeah. like interaction. You know, there's no there's no really real instant interaction. And, you know, it, it becomes like when you create something, it becomes a conversation. You say something, they go, I don't agree with that, or I do agree with that, or, you know, yeah, that's a great idea. I would never have thought of that. That's brilliant. Yeah. So do more of that, or don't do that. And, yeah, and it's a true and fro, and it, and it it takes minutes instead of a week. <laughs> do you think also there's uh, especially nowadays uh, there seems to be um, an option overload, isn't there? There's too many things you can do with technology now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think you that's can do anything, any, and you can do anything and. Um, I don't know what's gonna what's gonna become, you know, what AI is gonna do. I don't know how that's that's gonna work. I mean, no one knows how that's gonna work. But it's gonna take over and it's gonna do everything. And I think there will be a period, I mean not for me, for other people, but there will be a period where you won't do it yourself. You'll just there will be just people who know how to talk to AI. Yeah. And um, they will then program AI and they will, they will know how to communicate with it and what it can do and, you know, and then eventually it will take over and do everything. Yeah. It has. It already has. Starting, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's on its way. Um, yeah. So what happened with um, Kevin Mooney then? Because he, he got replaced, didn't he, um, by uh, Gary Tibbs. So what happened there? What, what was the story there? Uh, I don't really know the story because it, it was sort of, we sort of, even though you scheduled and you sort of live separately. Mm -hmm. So he got, he got married. He got yeah. married to Jordan, who was the person who first introduced us in the first place. She was the, the, the shop assistant in the sex shop. And she yeah. was managing, uh, married. She was managing Adam. She married, managed Adam and Nance for a long time. Yeah. And stopped managing them. And then I came in. And then we had other management, and then Kevin sort of got. I mean, it was a sort of strange sort of. It was uh, it was hard to feel, you know. It was a strange sort of that sort of land interaction because Kevin was now going out with Jordan, who was kind of you know not a member of the band, but around the band, and you 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 kind of think I don't know how I feel about this. I mean, they are adults; they can do what they want. And yeah. should I do I feel strange about it? Should I not feel strange about it? Is it all right? Is it not all right? I mean, I can't stop them going, mm -hmm. going out. But there are some point around that. I mean, I can't ask Jordan about this. I oh, for, for years I've been. I always think I should ask Jordan about this one day. Uh, she's dead now, but uh, I, I, somehow that she they got into smack, and oh, um, yeah. we didn't see Kevin very much. Uh, and me and Adam are, are the world's least druggy people. Yeah. I mean, I've been around. I've been around drugs, and but I don't know anything about them or what they do, or where to get them, or what to do with them, or what they feel like. I mean, I, I've never had interest, interest in it. And it was just a sort of change of personality, really. That you know, Kevin it was mm. sort of more and more unavailable, more and more kind of you know flaky, and it just. That's what happened. We we didn't actually even know that it was that it was heroin. I mean, it's only later on we told me about it. Hmm. And then 
well, we could, we, you can't continue, you can't continue, you know, you can't continue with someone in the band who's, who's, who's strung out, you can't do it. It's not yeah. possible. And I didn't know anything about recovery or how to get him help or, or anything. Um, and but also equally, you're thinking, well, is it my, you know, is it my responsibility to, to, to get him help? I, 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 in that documentary, the Metallica documentary, there's some outtakes with the original guitarist who's now in Megadeth, I'm saying, and he had a meeting with the drummer. And he says, yeah, I'm, I'm just really pissed off with you. I'm just really, really, I've been pissed off with you for like 20 years because you just you just left me in a hotel room. So we didn't just leave you until we tried everything to get you straight. We tried everything. We, we spent a year putting up with your shit and we couldn't do it anymore. You were taking us down with you. Yeah. And he said, and he said um, yeah, I can see why you do it. And you were right to do it. You were right to do it because I wouldn't have got straight and you wouldn't have become Metallica, but I'm still pissed off with you. <laughs> and he said, and he says that how and Metallica are the biggest heavy metal band in the world. How do you feel it? How do you think it feels for me to be in the second biggest band in the world? <laughs> not that bad. I mean, it's not you're, you're sleeping in doorways, are you? You're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you toured America, didn't you, just before? Um, uh, Stand and deliver. So, um, how, how did you find America? Did you find the, the audience were different to the British ones? Yeah, they were much more receptive, actually. They didn't have any yeah. of these punk. We were still going through, we still had a, a, a partly punk audience. And I remember we put our first gig in Boston, which was, it wasn't a huge place, it was a thousand, thousand capacity cl club, which, which a few years before would have been a similar huge place to us, but it wasn't after being after a uh, big English tour with yeah. thousand people it seemed quite small. And and I remember our security, one of our bodyguards went around to the bar and said, you know, um, oh you can't sell you can't sell uh, you can't sell alcohol in glass in glasses. You have to use plastic glasses. I said, well why? <laughs> and they said, well in case they throw something at the band. And they were mystified. I was like, why would the audience want to throw something to get the band? <laughs> <laughs> no one does that. You know. Yeah. So, you know, we had to adjust as, yeah, things were a little bit easier in America. Also, it's set up for rock and roll, it's set up for music biz, it's all, you know. Mm. Everything's fairly, it's, it's sort of, you know, as professional as an American can be. Um, so that aspect, and it and it became, and it was like, and it's that weird thing. It's like when I didn't expect it to be like this. I didn't expect it to be like this. It's like I thought this is exactly how I imagined it would be. So that's why I didn't actually expect it to be like that. But it actually that's was. Right. <laughs> so it was proper. It was proper pop star shit. It was all limousines and. Yeah. Just like more bodyguards and uh, you know being mobbed at the stage door and yeah never being able to go leave your room <laughs> <laughs> I can see why people drink and, and do drugs you can't do anything else yeah but then obviously it takes over and you really do don't do anything else but he never took over for us, so it's okay. Wasn't there a problem um, with some of the um, the Indian tribes over there because of the Adam's war paint uh, stage makeup? Yeah, I mean, this will now be called cultural appropriation. But obviously, mm -hmm. something I don't think he ever gave it a thought, but he, he met some people from, I think the first time we got there, from the whatever, the Native American people who were sort of. They thought he was sort of taking the piss, which he wasn't taking the piss. It wasn't a comedy act. So mm. they met him and they were all That's in the days when you could actually go to the people, the oppressed minority, that, and tell them, we don't mean to oppress you, and they will accept it and go, okay, we believe you. And it's like, yeah. 
don't take it any further. Whereas now, you know, obviously we'd be harangued and demonstrations by white people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember seeing this, this thing about, it was like the, the San Francisco Chiefs or something, and the, the, the football, a football team with... Yeah. And, the, and their logo is like a chief with a headdress on, and it's like... And they went around and talked to some Native Americans, and they, they said, do you find this offensive? And they go, well, no. And then there was an article where someone was like, well, you should find it offensive. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, then why, why don't you tell us how to feel? <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that the crowds in America differed depending on which part of the country you were in? Uh, yeah, the crowds, crowds always differ depending on which part of the country you're in. Um, yeah. In major cities, like in LA and New York, they seem a bit more subdued, like in London, they're a bit more subdued, but then you go, you drive however miles, however many miles it is, a thousand miles up to Glasgow. I know it's not the same country, but it's the same island, and they go fucking mad. And you know, I, I, I've never really understood why that happens, why pe people in different parts of the country have different attitudes. It doesn't make any mm. sense. Generally, in the middle, they're all kind of the same, they're all, they're all good. Responsive audiences in New York are a bit cool, but then again, they're not as cool as they are in London. So, yeah, and LA is just always madness. Yeah. Well, going back to the uh, well, going to the videos. Uh, I mean, you were one of the first bands to spend a lot of money on videos, and they were really well produced. Mm -hmm. um, so, did you get? Were you involved at all in the planning of them or the writing of the the videos? I I, I wasn't involved. I I wasn't involved. I mean, it was it was Adams. One of those things like the video is going to be the future. I didn't know what a video was. And it was talking about um, and but no one no one was making videos. There weren't any video companies. No one made any. I mean, there were a couple of things. I can't remember what videos were at the time. Yeah, you know, there was. Ashes to Ashes, that was a big video, wasn't it? Mm. Um, so Adam had the brilliant idea, we should go to advertising agencies. Oh, yeah. Mm. They're commercials for your single. There's commercials for your single. And I remember, I mean, going into going into Sony and saying, well, we want to do this, this bit. I think it was Ant Music, and it's going to cost 40 grand. And they just went fucking white. You know, <laughs> I'm going to spend more than four grand in video unless you're Bowie. Um, uh, but somehow you persuaded them to do it, and and then and then it, and then the whole video thing sort of you know exploded, and yeah, everyone had to do a video. I mean, I it's not, I, 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 I do I, I did sometimes think oh, I wish we hadn't started this. <laughs> I wish we took this is not what I wanted to happen. It's like we spent more money on one video than we did on the whole album. Right. And when you're the one having to sign checks, it's really, really painful. <laughs> you know, I, could buy, I could buy a car with that. <laughs> did you, because you're always really well dressed, aren't you? You always have really nice uh, clothes. Um, did you like dressing up on the videos? Yeah, that was the best bit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's the bit I like. The I, 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 that's the bit I like the most. Yeah, because <laughs> having been fans of Roxy Music and coming coming from you know nineteen seventy two when every everybody was dressed up, and then you know nineteen seventy two influenced the Blitz and everything. I mean, yeah. Adam was part of the Blitz. He hated that. I don't know why he hated that. I think he was just threatened by it. But I, you know, Steve Strange used to be my lo our lodge used to live with me and my mum and dad when he started the oh, Blitz. Really? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's an, another story. Steve, I mean, I used to, Steve was a friend of mine, and he got hepatitis by doing things he had no business doing. Um, he was then he was then in this hospital near our house, and it was like a real Hannibal Lecter. He was in this glass cage. <laughs> and I had to go and say, he didn't know anybody else sort of around, so I had to go and see him every day. And then he had nowhere to go. So, and then he came and lived with, uh, I said, we well, can come and stay with us for a while. 
And mm. he was, he was very, my, my mum loved him, he was very, very tidy, Steve. Um, and it was during this period that he started to blitz. I think he started Billy's and then they only started to blitz. It was just, it was in this period. So it was really good. So my lodger started to blitz, so I didn't have to pay to get in. <laughs> but that was all about dressing up. It was completely about dressing up and, you know, Mm. It was the anti-punk thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm Billy Bragg, a person I had not much respect for. I mean, just some interviews so, like, oh yeah, I've gone through punk, and then, and then this blitz thing came on, and 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 then it was just dressing up and, and elitism, and it wasn't like punk. It wasn't like punk because it wasn't punk. <laughs> <laughs> You could still go and be a punk, but not there. <laughs> yeah. Well, on the um, Friends and Foe tour, uh, you decided not to to join it. Uh, was that just because you didn't like touring? Yeah, that's because I didn't like touring. Yeah. Fed up with it by that time. We did so much. Um, and the pressures of it, it's just got really boring. It is really boring, touring. And I, I'm not, I don't, I'm, not, I'm okay with it now. I mean, it, it's not, I hated being on stage. I don't hate it anymore. I don't, I'd rather not do it. I mean, you know, mm. it's not something I suppose, it's not something I seek out. Um, I mean, I have, I mean, I've had, I mean, for, uh, just before lockdown happened, I, you know, I did Shakespeare's Sister. I did like a monthly Shakespeare's Sister because she runs my, best friend and she asked me to do it and I thought well that is okay I'll do mm. that because it's been playing it's not I mean Shakespeare's sister Shakespeare's sister are not motley crew there shouldn't be too many ructions and obviously these are like you know people in the band are you know older they're all my age and you know and, and some of my best friends so yeah. it should be easy which it was but that was sort of someone approached me who was, who was one of my best friends and I said yes and other people have approached me and I said, no, I don't really want to do that. Mm. Mm. So I'm, I'm not going to play, I'm not going to go out and play clubs anymore. Yeah. I mean, people always say, people always say, oh, isn't it great? Like, don't you ever want to do like intimate venues? No, I don't want to do intimate venues. I want to do stadiums. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were I, hate doing the tour. I hate doing intimate venues. You can see the audience. It's really bad. <laughs> Well, you you eventually did join the tour, didn't you? Because you had to sort of help them out. Yeah, Charles Char Char broke his arm. <laughs> <laughs> about, about a week, he got drunk and fell down some stairs and broke his arm. He couldn't play, so I had to go and do it. And I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> no escape. Fucking hell. But no escape from this, is it? Why did you eventually stop working with Adam? Was he just moving towards being an actor? Why, why did I stop working with him? Yeah, um, he was trying to get, uh, he's trying to move into acting, wasn't he? I believe around about that time. Yeah, but that was a sort of mid period we started to move into acting and move, moved into to LA. But we didn't stop working together. I thought, I mean, I thought his foray into acting, I, I, I just mystified. I said, what, why do you think this is going to be any better? Or why yeah. do you think you're good at it more, more, more to the point? Because you, you're really not, actually. And um, so we had a break. Of, but then I, you know, I did other things. Did Sinead O'Connor, and then about and then ninety five started working together again. And then then he got ill, and the whole thing just fell apart. It was just too, too. He just couldn't work anymore. Yeah. Sinead O'Connor, so how did all that come about? Because that's an interesting partnership, wasn't it? Yeah, um, it's because her manager at the time, Faulkner, Faulkner O'Kelly, was an old friend of mine from Punk Days. He used to manage, he used to manage Boomtown Rats, a band I hated, but never mind. But, but it was to the <laughs> friend. Um, so he just phoned me up and just said, I've got, oh, do you want to come down and put some guitar in this, on, on this? I'm working with this. Girl, and you know, to come put the guitar. And I said, Well, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I didn't get paid, but it was just a friend. Um, so the first thing I did was Mandinka, 
she wasn't there. She was pregnant at the time. She was just about to have Jake, so she wasn't there. And Faulkner's not a producer. So <laughs> of, it's like, um, okay, what would you like me to do? Oh, I'll do whatever you want. So that's the word, the, the words you don't want to hear in the studio. Well, I don't know. It's your record, isn't it? I don't really know. <laughs> and the artist isn't here. Uh, so it's the opposite. It's, it's what I was saying earlier. It's like there is that. It's like, we're back to no interaction. It's just me going. Um, I don't. Well, I think this is good. I don't know if she's going to think this, this is good because she's not here. Um, mm. I'll just do what I think. And so I did that. And then Paula said, Ah, oh, that was great. Do you want to do another one? Well, yeah, all right. <laughs> well, I played another one then. And I, so I played on a lot of tracks on that album. I don't get the credit. But I don't get the credit because I don't even know what I played on. I don't know which part they used or which guitarist they used. Um, so I think he got into that. I, think, I was watching a documentary about Steely Dan. And it was like, they used to have like, they literally had eight different guitar solos, but eight, but eight different guitarists. And then they just put everything down and think about it later. And that's sort of what they did. Hmm. I couldn't work like that. I was just driving mad. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you get you get you know, one or maybe two solos. If you try and get a, a solo, you think, okay, that's not great. I know another guy. Let's let's him let him have a go. So mm. between two of them, you must be able to come up a solo. But eight of them, lucky hell, you don't know we listening to. <laughs> um, uh, so, it, it, but it was like that because the, the album had no vocals at the time. I didn't even know she could sing. Didn't even yeah. know what songs called or what they're about. I mean, it just <laughs> <laughs> desperately writing calls down on a piece of paper. And Father didn't know how the songs went, so I had to sit there and work them all out. Like, yeah. yeah. It's not the worst gig in the world, but it was it was frustrating. Well, tell us about your guitars. I mean, there's quite a few around you in the room. Didn't you used to have about a hundred at one point? Well, I don't think I've got a hundred anymore. I don't know. I've got about 80. I don't know where they oh. all are, but they're all people are always terribly impressed by that. But they're not all um I mean these two strats are sort of top of the I mean because I've, I've been using it to work, these two this one, this one. Well, so all these are sort of valuable. They're all they're hundred and ten thousand quid league now. I don't have which guitars are worth, you know, 10,000 quid, you know. Yeah. 50 of them are worth 300 quid each, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like I like junky guitars, I like kind of like. But the thing with guitars is that, that is my, that, the one in the corner, the yellow one is my original, that's my second, that's my second junior, which was $325. It was so valueless to me that I um, it sat in a case for four years until I opened it. I thought, what? what? What's this? Because <laughs> <laughs> I bought a load of them. And they're like 11,000 quid now. Oh, wow. Well. And it got, I mean, it's like when I did Shakespeare's sister, it was like I uh, I wanted to bring up five or six guitars. I thought, God, I can't, I can't take them out anymore. So it's like, I'm going to say one of my questions, which is now 25 grand. Mm. So I can't really risk a 25 grand on a guitar on a tour. I can't afford it. I mean, it's like, if it breaks, that's it. You know, you can yeah. repair it. But it's never worth 25 grand again. Yeah. And that, that's 10 grand. And again, if it breaks, it's not going to be worth 10 grand. So I had to rebuy everything, like new versions. So those are part of my, you know, they're part, part of the collection. They're sort of replacements for things that are far more, cheaper replacements for the things that are far more. <laughs> Have you still got the guitars from the uh, Ants days? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Uh, yes. That's yeah. one of them. I used, I used that one at Live Aid. Oh, right. How did you find Live Aid? That's a nice lead in, actually. What was it like playing at Live Aid? Uh, it was a bit like, kind of like, because there were so many people doing it and it was so, you know, so, so mad. It was a bit like, kind of like, 
you just sort of arrive, do it and go off. And then it was only like the next day you think, God, what we've just done. The whole yeah. the whole thing blew up. But it was I, I remember meeting Pete Townsend. And he was typically Pete Townsend by saying, This is all shit. We were, we were, you know, this is worse <laughs> than <the book." laughs> <laughs> Which makes you only love Pete Townsend more. <laughs> was it quite overwhelming then? Because I mean, obviously, it's a massive crowd, wasn't it? Was it overwhelming? Yeah, on, being on stage. No, no, <laughs> no. We 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 know we never played a crowd that big. I don't know what the capacity of, of Wembley Stadium is, but we tend to have ten thousand, twelve thousand. So it does come to point we can't see anymore, so it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. Hmm. Going back to guitars, um, didn't you buy? Uh, you, you keep getting asked this. I'm sorry, but uh, didn't you get um, Dave Hill Super Yob? Yeah, it's next door. It's is next it? door. It's the cupboard next door. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> How much did you pay for that? If you don't mind me asking. Five hundred quid. Five hundred. Yeah. Must be worth a fortune now. Well, I don't know. I mean, what's Super Yob worth? I mean, it's worth either a million pounds or nothing compared to you know. <laughs> yeah. it's like, you no, know, guitar, guitars are not like cars. Uh, you can, if you want to buy, a car, if you want to buy a two thousand five BMW with twenty thousand miles, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of a rough. rough it's not even rough. It's like, it's like you kind of know what it's going to be worth. You can compare them with all the others. And it's yeah. like a house. You just compare those with um, compare houses with the houses around it. But guitars are not like that. It, it, it's it's like what there's wood. I mean, I'd have to find someone who really wanted Superior, and I'm the only person who really wants Superior. And the other people who really want Superior can't afford to buy it. Yeah. Hmm. It's a bit of a like that. It's only it's one of those things like Superior is one of those things that um, it has no market value. It's only worth what someone's been. Uh, Willing to pay for it like that has a market value. The yellow one, the black, the black one. As you compare, you can compare the black one to other, or this red one. You can compare them to other strats of that year. You look up yeah. the serial number, just uh, see what other strats are selling for. Mm. I, don't, I don't know what that strat is. Ten grand or something. No, no it's not. <laughs> uh, so have you got? Have you got any regrets about your career? Anything you, you wish you oh, hadn't well, done? Yeah, loads. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can't think of them now. They're not, they're not really career regrets, but it's always you can go, yeah, we should have, you know, once we've done that Prince Charming tour, we should have taken it to America, like everybody said, but we couldn't really afford to take the whole production and... I didn't really, at the time I didn't want to go to America, but that's what we should have done. We should have not. We should have not the production on the end and just gone, just got on the plane and got a simple stage and done that. That's what we should have done. Uh, we should have spent more time in Europe, but at the time I didn't want to. Um, mm. So all those sorts, I mean, those are professional regrets. So lots of personal regrets as well. Um, Oh, you know, you know like, I don't, I, we shouldn't let Miss, Miss Conti mix it, mix people or rock, 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 people or rock that way. We should have done that edit on that track. And every, every time you listen to Kings One, one two, you think, oh, I really want to mix it. There's no point now. Or oh, I shouldn't yeah. have done that. But at the time, yeah. I was trying to barely play. I, could, I couldn't get the ideas in my head out when yeah. you put a guitar in it. But it's it's like you know you get into Doctor Whoisms, isn't it? And it's like I'm 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 not the person. I can't make Kings of Rock onto it again. Well, I wouldn't, but uh, yeah. I, I there was some there was some interview I was reading about some woman was going about the current state of the music business and that she wasn't getting anywhere, and she said it's all really, you know it's terrible now and. Bob said Bob Dylan wouldn't get signed now. That doesn't really make any sense. I mean, which Bob Dylan from what era? Why would they sign him? And if he hadn't been signed when he got signed, then the music business would be different. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, 
What would happen if the Beatles didn't exist? They wouldn't sign the Beatles now. But then the industry wouldn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Do you think this entire Spotify thing's really bad for the industry, music industry, or do you think this, you know? What? Do you, you know the, the the digital download Spotify uh, thing? Yeah. Do you think that's well, a bad it, thing? It, I can't say it's a bad thing or a good thing. It's, it's, it's just progress, you know. Mm. Uh, it's like saying, you know, is the push button phone better than the, better than the rotary phone? You know, it's, um, do you regret the passing of the rotary phone? Well, no, not really. I mean, it's just it's gone, isn't it? Um, what I find funny is like when they started all those file sharing things like Napster and that went wrong and then you know all, all these and then people could just get things for nothing off the internet. Yeah. So obviously it's like the music fan has a voracious appetite for anything that's free. So they hate paying for anything. Um so and there they all were downloading all this stuff. And and it's like you know, going, oh, well, you know, and then, but music should be free. Well, why? <laughs> why well, <laughs> it it's free then, shouldn't it? And, and then, uh, you know, and quoting, you know, and thinking, yeah, we're really sticking it to the man. It's sort of, we're really like, you know, we're really going to bring down the establishment. Well, no, but what you brought down <laughs> were the kind of, you know, the, the grassroots of it all, the people making it, you know, People can't afford to tour. People oh, can't afford to make records. Not you know, they don't get paid. Mm. Otherwise, that you, you you're going to start with a whole a whole bunch of um, you know a whole bunch of artists who've got to have Saturday jobs throughout to do it. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's all about money. It's all about money. If you can't if you can't make if you can't live, then what, then you can't do it, can you? Yeah. I mean, I know not not everybody is, wants to be a millionaire. Not everybody wants to be Taylor Swift, but just to have a, a, a basic living is like is not too much to ask. Yeah. I mean, I remember yeah. there was a thing that one of those. I'm in a band. I hate him, crass. One of those guys a couple of years ago did like a solo tour, and he went out, yeah. and, and I went on some crass website which I shouldn't have done, but I did. And the people were just bemoaning the fact that they were charging money, you know, for these. Well, so you want him to come and sing for you for nothing? And how's he going to get there? Where's he going to sleep? Yeah. You know, you're trying <laughs> to go to bed for the night. I mean, it's just your basic human necessity. He's got no food. How's he going to get there? He's going to, he's going to put petrol in his car to get there to you. But no, you just want, like I said, you know, the music fans appetite for three free things. I mean they begrudge playing for anything. Yeah. Mm. Are you still in touch with the other band members? Yeah. 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 I mean I'm sort of in touch with all of them really. Um I mean we're all still friends. I'm certainly still friends with Kevin and Chris or Chris and Chris and Bang. Um I mean the only thing the only person I'm out of touch with is Adam. Mm. Which is, you know, it, it does cause me. It's just the way in, isn't it? I mean, it's just like, I mean, I remember saying to Jordan when he died, I mean, say, oh, should I just call him up? And she said, and there's, there's all, I mean, my girlfriend at the time was always wanting to, like, why don't you get the ants back together? Why don't you get the ants back together? What, I mean, why do you want me to get the ants back together? Why? Yeah. Uh, because so you can be pop star girlfriend, you know. <laughs> and um he said, Well, it's your ego. You won't you won't um you won't it's your ego stopping you from calling him. I said, No, it's not, it's his ego. Because if I call him, the way his mind works or used to work would be like kind of, ah, oh, you've called me because you need me. No, I don't need you. I just thought it'd be good. It's a good thing to do that we should, get, you know, maybe do something. But I don't need you, Adam. I'm all right without you. Yes. Yeah. So it it immediately put puts you that or, or the the relationship is sort of you know because that's just the way he is. Like if he calls me, it's it suddenly I kind of we're on equal footing. If I call him, I'm put into sort of like I need him and. 
uh, I'm sort of secondary, you know. Yeah. But that's the way, that's, that's pop star ego, you know, singer egos. You know, yeah. I, I think, look, Adam, I promise, I will sign a piece of paper that says you are better at me, better than me in every single way. You're better at me. You're better at going to the toilet. You make better tea than me. I mean, every, I am just not worth it. I will sign this piece of paper. You just, just fucking get on with it. If it makes you happy. <laughs> but I mean, he's not in the Morrissey league of, of that things. You know. Yeah. Mor Morrissey, seen, I don't, I've never met him. I want to, but it, it seems to be like just pathologically obsessed with kind of like status and adoration. And, Ego and control and all that. I couldn't do yeah. this no fucking way. Yeah. Life's too short to be like life's too short to go through you can you could just about do it when you're 20, but when you know when you're 65, you think I'm not putting up this fucking shit now. No. You know, you pay me five million quid and I will put up with it for six months, but I'm not yeah. putting up with it. No, a grand a week. I mean, no, don't need it. <laughs> and even if I did need a grand a week, I still wouldn't put up with it because it's life's too short and life's getting much, much shorter. And, and to live in misery with these idiots. Yeah. Just can't do it anymore. So, what was the thing about Adam? So, yeah, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my, my, my ex girlfriend was saying, oh, yeah, but you know, you should. If you think I'm stressed now, if you think I'm in a bad mood at home now, you 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 ain't seen nothing. Yeah, so how how bad of a mood I would be in all day and all night, and how much I would be kicking doors and throwing things through windows, um, if I had to get back into Adam and Yance. Mm. I'd like to get back into Adam and Yance. I'd like us to do you know a tour or some gigs, but not. You know? Want to do it permanently? Yeah. Have you got any projects coming up? Um. Uh. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Possibly. I mean, after a long, after after the Shakespeare sister, then there was lockdown. Then I got ill with COVID, and then I was ill for a long time. And it's only been the last year that I've been kind of you know had actually energy to do anything. So. I've been doing a bit of playing. I've been, been doing sort and sort of thing. You know, I'm, I, and I've always turned down the kind of inevitable book, mainly mm. because I didn't know how to do it. And also, it seemed like a lot of work because you, I mean, you can write and record a song in one day if you really want to. I mean, you know, three days at the most. Um, but writing a book, I mean, it's just that's real work. And I'm not that sort of a writer. Yeah. So I'm, um, I've got an agent and sort of thinking about possible gross writers, but it, this is this book thing, I've only decided to do it in the last, it's only been three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Before that, I, I just thought I, I can't be bothered. I, mean, I, I talk to other people and I, I say, are you doing, what are you doing? Are you doing the inevitable book? And they all say, no, it's too much worth my money. Um, because there is, I mean, unless you're J.K. Rowling and, and your story gets taken over, picked up by by Hollywood, there's not really a lot of money in my team, unless you're selling millions of copies. Yeah. I mean, it makes, it makes record royalties look pathetic, so <laughs> I'm very spoiled, spoiled by record royalties. Well, thank you so much for doing this uh, chat, Marco. It's been really, really interesting. Oh, well, it's just far. I, I, I did ask awesome. you. You didn't tell me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, it's just basically um, I just interview people from, you know, where the world of music, film, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, I looked at your YouTube. Um, you have some interesting people, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I so like how, it. How do, you, how, do you find, how do you find these people? You just um, follow them home from the pub? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I, I, I sort of know um, a few of them, and through them, you know, I sort of uh, befriend other people, and it just sort of goes from there, really, you know. Um, so, oh, yeah. I mean, that's one thing about social media, you can do that. I mean, you'd have to, 
if you ever wanted to interview me before, you'd have to find my, I don't know how you would find my, my manager or agent, I don't know. Then you'd have to call them and then they would have to get back to you, which of course they wouldn't. And uh, then they would tell me and I'd have to say, well, what is it? And they'd say, I don't know, I'll have to phone you back. And it will go on and on like that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, but, but this is quick and easy. You know, are you available Thursday? Uh, are you available Wednesday? Uh, yes. That's, that's, the, that's <laughs> a lot easier, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah otherwise it'll be just memos and phone calls backwards and forwards for six weeks. Yeah. Are there any um, people that you add as heroes that you've contacted via social media or anything like that? No. I've never contacted oh. any. No. no. Not in a stalkerish way, but just, you know, just contacted them and said, uh, I like your music. I, <laughs> the only contact I've ever had was I had a, I, I had a, uh, what's an uh, Instagram page, but then mm. I had to shut it down, sort of baby reindeer stuff. So, but anyway, that was quite useful. I then found this picture, it, it was a rocker, and he had, all mods are bent, written on the back of his jacket in studs. <laughs> so I, I posted that, and then Pete Townsend came along and said, yeah, that sounds about right. I said, you just made it official. <laughs> all mods are <laughs> Pete Townsend says all mods are bent. <laughs> I mean, there is no higher higher mod. He's higher than Paul Weller in, in the mod, uh, mod hierarchy, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> right. Uh, well, thanks for that, uh, Marco. Um, I'll, I'll cut that there if that's okay, but thanks for giving me on so much time. It's been brilliant, really interesting. That's all right, anytime. Well, not anytime. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you know when it's up anyway. All right, all right. I'll see you later. Cheers, mate. Nice talking to you.